Our scripture reading that I selected this morning comes from Revelation. And it's the seventh chapter, verses 9 through 17. Listen to these words. After this, I looked, and there was a great cloud that no one could number. They were from every nation, tribe, people, and language. They were standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They wore white robes, and they held palm branches in their hands, and they cried out with a loud voice, Victory belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood in a circle around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures and they fell face down before the throne and they worshiped God saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and always. Amen. And then one of the elders said to me, Who are these people wearing white robes, and where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. And then he said to me, These people have come out of great hardship. They have washed their robes and then made them white in the Lamb's blood. This is the reason they are before God's throne. They worship him day and night in his temple, and the one seated on the throne will shelter them. They won't hunger or thirst anymore. No sun or scorching heat will beat down on them, because the lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them. He will lead them to springs of life-giving water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. I didn't say this earlier, but good morning, saints. Good morning, sinners. Great, we're all here. We're all here. Uh, an author, Leonard Sweet, anytime he speaks, that's all, what he always starts with. Uh, in some traditions, the Catholic traditions, um, they really believe in the whole saint thing. In fact, they have elections and there's a whole criteria on what it needs to be a saint. But in our tradition as being a Methodist, just like I told the kids, the only thing that's required to be a saint is to realize that you're forgiven. So we're all saints. And yes, we are all sinners. Well, our vacation, Karen and I, we just got back from North Carolina a couple weeks ago, and I said, uh, on this whole few weeks, we're going to be talking about disciples and uh, what, what is a disciple, um, how to be a disciple, and why we make disciples and what we do. And some of the people that we met on vacation, uh, last week I talked about John and Jan Winters, and um, uh, Mark, if you could go to the next slide. Um, This is actually Cole Rollerson, and Cole Rollerson, we actually got a chance to meet a couple weeks ago. She she actually made this pastor, me, do dishes for three hours. I don't like to do dishes, but you know what? Working with Cole, I did dishes. Of course, I had one of those nifty dishwashing things where you just load up the trays, you stick them under, you pull the thing down, and then it seemed like 10 minutes later they were done. And stuff, but I actually did dishes for three hours um, in her kitchen. She is actually the uh, uh, food service manager for First United Methodist Church of Hendersonville, North Carolina, and we got a chance to talk with her. And uh, uh, one thing that that radiated from her is her love for Jesus, also her love for food. She corrected me when, I don't know why we were talking about that, but uh, somebody had mentioned shepherd's pie. And she quickly corrected that, you know, in England, what the Americans would call shepherd pie is what they would call um, um, something. Because shepherd's pie actually has lamb in it, lamb meat, and not hamburger or not uh, beef. 
So uh, cottage pie. She said, really, what we say as shepherd's pie is cottage pie. Um, but we walked into the kitchen, and she had these things laid out on trays. She had maybe 50 of them, maybe 60 of them. And they looked like mini pizzas. So I says, oh, what are the toppings that are on the pizzas? And she quickly, correct, or quickly uh, corrected me and said, no, those are pie crust. So she had a name for them, like a French name, and it had goat or um, goat cheese and uh, squash, and it had all kinds of vegetables on them. And she was making them, and they were going to sell them. They were um, going to like put them in the oven for a little bit, and then sell them so people could go home and continue to bake them as a fundraiser for one of their mission projects. Um, this past year, their church got a grant, and they bought one of those food trailers. You know, we see them like Guzman, Taco Guzman in town. It's a trailer like that. It's a fully equipped kitchen on wheels. And the Friday night that we were there was the first time they actually operated it uh, for something that they, a uh, youth event that they call Fifth Quarter. And they had um, a youth come from all over town uh, after the football game and they uh, served walking tacos out of this food trailer. But the one thing that I really noticed is how, how she connected everything that she did in the kitchen to bringing people closer to Christ. And when we think about discipleship, any of us in our jobs, in our daily lives, I mean, that's... A, that's a meaning of what a disciple is. I would also say that Co is a saint. And when I told the kids, that's kind of the definition that it comes down in the Methodist that being a disciple is deciding to follow Jesus. But a saint is someone who realizes that they're forgiven by Jesus. You know, growing up, I always loved the saints, the saints of the church. You know, I love the traditional ones, St. Francis of Assisi and all the little um, animals that followed him around, St. Augustine and his theology of grace, that even our common, mundane, everyday lives are choked full of the overflowing grace of God. You know, many of us know and we, we witness the work of St. Teresa and her dignifying work with the poor in Calcutta. You know, we have St. Valentine. We even have a holiday. He was a Roman martyr, and we often associate him uh, as the patron saint of love. But he was also the patron, patron saint of people with asthma, of epilepsy, and even the patron saint to beekeepers. Then we have St. Patrick. St. Patrick, we have a holiday for St. Patrick. You know, the Apostle of Ireland is what he was referred to. And at age 16, he was captured by a group of Irish pirates and was a slave for six years until he escaped and talked his way onto a ship headed for England. He became a priest, a bishop, and there even a myth that St. Patrick banished all snakes from Ireland. Now, that's actually a myth because there are still snakes in England. And then, of course, St. Nicholas. St. Nicholas is, was of Greek descent and also known as Nicholas the Wonder Worker. St. Nicholas is um, also patron saint of sailors and merchants and archers, repentant thieves, children, brewers, pawnbrokers, and students in various cities and countries around Europe. And he also became legendary for his habit of secret gift giving, Santa Claus. But then there are those really odd saints. Like one, I'm sure you guys have heard of, Saint Drogo. Drogo. But he was reportedly not the most handsome, or was uh, not the most handsome guy you ever saw. 
And now he's considered the patron saint of unattractive people. And then there's Saint Ledwina, where she fell ice skating at the age of 15 and never fully recovered from her injuries. She became the patron saint of ice skaters. See, there's a saint for almost everything. That saint really could have prayed to be a little more, you know, that patron saint of ice skaters, I should have prayed to them a little more. You know, when I was out on a frozen lake and I strapped those steel blades to my feet. But anyhow, today is set aside in the church year to remember the saints Not just those big name saints that I just mentioned, but today is All Saints Sunday. It's not some saint Sunday. I mean, in our tradition, saints aren't a special category of people, ones that are sinless and do miraculous things. We don't have any system whereby people are elected to sainthood, but we do not pray to saints, nor do we believe that they serve as a mediator to God. See, United Methodists believe what is said in 1 Timothy, Timothy, there is one God, there is also one mediator between God and humankind, Christ Jesus himself, human, who gave himself a ransom for all. See, John Wesley focused not on sainthood, but entirely on the saving grace of Jesus Christ. See, Methodists call people saints because they exemplify the Christian life. You could say every Christian can be considered a saint. In our tradition, saints are just regular sinners who happen to be forgiven. And that would be all of us. And I could have easily said instead of disciples among us, that we are saints among us. So we have a day set aside each year to remember forgiven sinners who have died. We have this day set aside each year to honor our dead and to honor our grief, to celebrate their memories and to celebrate God's mercy. And then many of us have come here today or, you know, have come other Sundays and we've come a day with our hearts heavy with the loss of someone dear to us our own saints. And I, like you, stand here today and I grieve my own dead, those I loved who I have lost. You know, the the passage that I read, often I read that passage in Revelation at funerals or at memorial services, but today I also chose it for us, the living. Because to me, through it, Through this scripture, it gives us an incredible glimpse of heaven. It gives each one of us sinners who decide to follow Jesus, to be his disciples, saints, the forgiven sinner, that gives us hope. And when I have said that communion is that word eschatological or the study of the end times, It is in this passage of scripture that gives us such a glimpse of what it'll be like when we all get to heaven. What a glorious day that will be. Yet, we are in this life. And what better way than to practice? Yes, practice. Practice singing. Practice worshiping, practice loving God, practice loving our neighbor, practice until we get good at it. I mean really good at it, to bring heaven down here to us because that is what disciples, that's what saints do. You know, the vision that was in chapter 7 of Revelation when it says, then he said to me, these people have come out of great hardship They have washed their robes and they've made them white in the Lamb's blood. This is the reason they are before God's throne. They worship him day and night in his temple. And the one seated on the throne will shelter them. They won't hunger or thirst anymore. No sun or scorching heat will beat down on them. Because the Lamb 
who is in the midst of the throne, will shepherd them. He will lead them to the springs of life-giving water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is a revelation from John. You know, there's an image of countless tribes and people gathered around God's throne, and they had suffered the ordeal of living in a world that can break your heart. Their souls were stained by loss, regret, sin, and shame. But on the throne of God, they had been washed in the blood of the Lamb and made clean. They encountered the compassion of Christ in the most condensed form, and it healed what was broken, and it cleansed what was stained. I mean, that's so beautiful to me that we can go through all of our stuff, all of some of our own making, some of the making of others. We can accumu uh, accumulate so much grief and pain in this life, and yet, in our faith and our hope, that those are the parts that won't last. Because Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, is at work. And that means the story is still working itself out, and it's not finished yet. This week I read a devotional by a, uh, she was a former, well she's still a Lutheran pastor and she has a, she had a church that she started in Denver, Colorado called uh, Saints and Sinners. And she wrote a book uh, years ago called Accidental Saints and Sinners. And her name's Nadia Boltz Weber, and she said this in her devotional. In my limited understanding of all this, all I know is that we all come from God. I swear you can smell him on the heads of newborn babies. And while we are here, we have access to God, our divine source. And when we come to God in prayer, and when we are forgiven by someone, and when we show mercy, and when we love ourselves, and when we are of service to others, and when we sing, and when we admit our faults, and even when we weep, these are thin places in which the veil between the heart of God, or that and the heart of God, heaven is translucent. We can actually see it. See, I'm not an expert on the hereafter because I've never been there. But I do know this, that when we die, we somehow return to the divine, our source, God. And because God is love, the love we share here on earth is what connects us. It is what unites us. It's, it's eternal, uh, us eternally with everyone who has loved us. And you could say that God is the glue, the super glue that unites us when we disagree, the, the gorilla glue that in some cases that holds us all together when it seems to be a chasm that divides us. And even after we die, we get to be the ancestors of the generations to follow. Maybe we even get to see them off when they are born and welcome them home when they die. I mean, wouldn't it be great if we could be on the fellowship committee in heaven? To have the best coffee. By the way, St. Drogo that I mentioned, the, the guy that wasn't too handsome, he's also the patron saint of coffee. You thought it might have been Starbucks, didn't you? I mean, and I just know the food. You know, Co and Helen's got a surprise for us after our service today. She ate muffins. But Co and Helen would be right there in the kitchen, along with some of our saints that I'm going to read in a few minutes, making the muffins, making those things that I call pizzas, but were something that I couldn't pronounce. It would be a fellowship party that would be lit. I don't know if you know that word, but that's youth, that's teenage lingo for being the bomb, or in my generation, groovy. 
You know, it, it'd be the best party we have ever imagined. You know, I mean, talking about ancestors, I mean, if you look in the Bible, 800 years before the book of Revelation was written, the prophet Isaiah wrote a similar vision in Isaiah 25 of God working this story out. But he included the menu. Starting at verse 6, it says, On this mountain, the Lord of heavenly forces will prepare for all peoples a rich feast, a feast of choice wines, of select foods, rich in flavor, of choice wines, well refined. He will swallow up on this mountain the veil that is veiling all peoples that shroud and enshrouding all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The Lord God will wipe away every tear from every face. He will remove his people, disgrace from all the whole earth, for the Lord has spoken. And they will say on that day, look, this is our God for whom we have waited, and he has saved us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let's be glad and rejoice in his salvation. And the Lord's hand will indeed rest on this mountain. I mean, when you hear those words, isn't it beautiful? I mean, I have no idea why so many churches try to make our faith so difficult into something sort of like a reward and punishment deal. I don't know why so many people seem to think we only get to return to the one who created us if we say the right things, we believe the right things, we do the right things, only if we happen to attend the right church and have the right lifestyles and even political affiliations. Oh, if we could only be that powerful. Friends, if as the prophet Isaiah said, God is swallowing up death, I just can't imagine God spits anybody out in the process. Can the blood of the lamb only wash garments that are lightly stained? It is just isn't like that. We aren't more powerful than God's grace or God's mercy. And our failings are never as powerful as God who sees to it that all the shortcomings that are so glaring fade when in the glory of our, uh, our eyes adjust to the light of Christ and we finally see how that story works out. Because God promises this. They won't hunger or thirst anymore. No sun or scorching heat will beat down on them. He will swallow up death forever because the lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them. He will lead them to the springs of life-giving water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, my rock and redeemer. Amen. Yes, today is All Saints Sunday. And as I say, it's not some saints Sunday, but our saints here at Zion United Methodist Church, and we'll have um, uh, some pictures of them, that we that have gone on to join Christ and God at that heavenly banquet table. January 14th, Minnie Tolly left the earthly bounds. She was 86 years old. She was an active member. She ran the kitchen, I understand. So she'd be, she'd be there in the, fixing the food in heaven. She also owned her own ceramics store. Karen Ellis, who on March 17th, at 79 years old, left her earthly bounds. She ran the office here at Zion for 26 years. You know, when I got here, I keep seeing the name Karen Marsick because that was her name before she married John. 
she still has reminders here of the time she spent with us. On April 14th, at 76 years old, Robert Bradner, the spouse of our former pastor, Gail Bradner, he was born and raised in Spring Valley. He supported many mission projects throughout the United Methodist Church, and he made mission trips to Alaska and Louisiana. And he was also an overnight volunteer host at PADS Shelter in Dixon and also Peru. And then Edna Good on April 15, 99 years old, was a member of our church. She, she made pies. I understand she made incredible pies. She also loved to crochet. When I did her memorial service, her daughter Lynn came up to me and she said, I have all these boxes of these doilies. And I said, bring them to the service. And we laid them out on the table. And you know, everyone took one of those doilies as a reminder of Edna. As a tangible reminder of the time she spent with us. So as we gather around the table, we come. Not because that table itself is so special, but because it also echoes another table. A table that stretches as far as the eye can see. A table that is laden with God's good gifts. A table where no one goes hungry or sits alone. A table where everyone we ever loved or whoever loved us sits and feasts together. In our own lives, we sit at tables where there are empty chairs. People we love and we miss. People we can no longer stop by for dinner or come to for holidays. And we grieve those empty tables. But now that they are in Christ, our separation is only a temporary thing. See, we grieve those empty chairs. But we know that in Christ, our separation is only a temporary thing. And as I light these candles, for Minnie, for Karen, for Robert, for Edna. I invite you to also think about the saints in your life. The people whose memories you carry in your hearts. And I invite you now to say them out loud or even silently in your hearts as I light this candle. For all those we have mentioned in your presence, God, we give thanks. We come gladly to this table to eat once more with those who love to join, with all the saints, all the saints in praising God, Jesus Christ, who defeated death and leads us all to God's heavenly banquet, where all are welcome. In our communion liturgy, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right to give our thanks to you, God, creator of all we know, all that is seen and unseen. You form the world. Every star and tree and ocean, that work of your hands, even us. But more than dust and clay, you breathed your breath into us. You made us into your image. You walked with us in the garden. And even when death crept in, you refused to abandon us because you found a way. Still death haunted your people in Egypt when they faced slavery in the promised land where they chose war in Babylon, where they were forced to live in exile. 
Even the good times, not all flourished. Hunger and poverty, arrogance and greed, all threaten the life of your people. So you sent your prophets to remind them to be good to each other. And that death and war and exile never have to be the last word. That you would always return to redeem and rescue us. And there was nowhere they could go. Not, not even down to the pits of Shaul. Where you were not present with them. In time, you sent your son to walk among us, fully God, fully human. You ate and you laughed and you made friends who taught and healed, forgive sinners. And you called out the hypocrites and you risked safety for the sake of your kingdom who wept when his friend Lazarus died, who knew grief and loss as we do. See, death haunted Jesus too. He, he always knew he would be part of his story, but in a single breath, he moved from fearing death to trusting you. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours will be done. And so Jesus was crucified and his friends began to grieve. But grief only lasted three days because while death was part of Jesus' story, it was not the end. See, Jesus broke death's power because he showed us once and for all that God's love is stronger than death. Death need no longer haunt us. It is a shadow fleeing before the burning light of God. Therefore, we praise you. Joining our voice with choirs of angels and with the great multitude no one can count from every nation from every tribe and people and languages all the ordinary saints who have finished their race and sing forever to the glory of your name as we join in that never-ending hymn holy 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 lord god of power and might heaven on earth are full of your glory hosanna in the highest Hosanna in the highest. And on the night before Jesus died, when he knew he could not be with his disciples much longer, he gave them a sign to remember him by. First he took bread from the table and the Lord, and, the Lord, and after giving thanks to you, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take, here, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. And now, Spirit, move us, that we might know we too are counted among the saints, God's beloved children, vessels of God's grace. And we pray that we might be thankful and transformed so our lives may proclaim the one crucified and the one who is risen. Great is our mystery of faith that Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. Now, gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit on all that are gathered here and I'm on these gifts of bread and juice that the bread we break and the cup that we share together may remind us of that in ordinary things. Your love is found in ordinary lives. Your grace is known in ordinary days. We can find your presence. Keep us breaking bread together in joy and in faith until you return to this world you love, this earth you made, and this people you cherish. Until that day, we lift our prayer to you, using the words recited by generations, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive those who trespass as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The feast is ready. The bread which 
represents the body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Thanks be to God. In the cup, the new covenant, the new salvation, poured out for you and for many, drink it in remembrance of him. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Jesus Christ, Lamb and Shepherd, we remember you here as we remember all your saints. Help us to remember you not just in this sanctuary, but in our homes, our schools, our cars, our workplaces. To remember in every part of our lives and to remember in our lives that it's just choke full with your grace. And that we may never be alone, but surrounded by the cloud of witnesses, united by your love. Amen.